the set of natural numbers in the way you in something like the way you usually see it where you define the natural numbers to be e either zero or successor of a natural number except here we need to define what the successor is and the neat little thing about this is you can define the successor of any set whatsoever and the way you do this is well we can take the union of two sets simply by using the axiom of pairing along with the axiom of union and define x union y and so we can define the set that contains x if x is a set we can define the set that contains x as simply by pairing of x comma x so there we go now you can define the successor of x with the axiom of union and pairing by saying that the successor of x is the set itself union with the set that contains x and this behaves much like you'd want a successor it makes the thing a little bit bigger and in an incremental manner so this is the model of successor we use and it has the nice property that x is contained in its successor so you can tell when something is less than another one because it'll be contained inside and not only that but x will be contained in its double successor triple successor and so on so this gives you a very natural way of ordering the natural numbers. Just, is this natural number contained in another natural number? So let's see some examples of this at work. So, um, okay, so maybe I do that later. I'll, I actually have code that'll make, this, make these things for us. Um, but the axiom of infinity says there exists a set which if a thing is in the set then so is its successor so this set has the property that all of its elements if you pick any one of its elements and put the successor on it the successor will be inside that set too much like you would want to happen with um, numbers with integers if you have a number you would expect the next number to be a number two. So that's the motivation and this is how it works. And the axiom says there exists such a set that is closed under successor. And the way in which you get the integers themselves is actually quite a bit more difficult. But at any rate, here are some, so, so the question there is, with the axiom of infinity, how do you get just the natural numbers and not some weird set? Well, you have to take some, the, these, so these sets which are closed under successor are called inductive sets. So you pick an inductive set and you take all the subsets of the inductive set that are also inductive and you take the intersection of all the inductive subsets show that any intersection of inductive subsets is also inductive and the intersection will be unique and it will be the same subset if you take some other inductive subset. That's, uh, it's, ki it's kind of a mouthful but it goes some, it's actually kind of uh, a bit. So you sort of take, in other words, you take the initial inductive subset, that's the smallest one and that's your integers. But okay. Here are some natural numbers. The number zero is simply the empty set. And, okay, no surprise there. You'd expect the empty set to have how many elements? Well, zero, right? So why not just make the empty set itself zero? And, okay, you want its successor. So the successor is this, but the empty set union with any set is just itself. So the number one is the set which contains the empty set. And, oh look, one has exactly one element in it, namely the empty set. So what you did is you took a bag, which is empty, and you put it inside another bag, 
That's the number one. Okay, so what about number two? Well, you take one union the second that contains one. That is the set that contains zero and one. And that's, that's the set that contains the empty set and the set that can... It, uh, anyway, you get the point, right? So I, I'm not going to try to say it all out. You can... You could have a... So, so if you're ever bored one day, you can have a contest with your friend who can uh, talk out the largest set possible without um, tripping up. Um, and if they fail, maybe you have a shot of something. <laughs> so I think um, we are going to the bar. Um, I win. <laughs> so you see when you get to four, this gets to be quite a, quite a bit of um, a chore. There's actually a better way of writing this as, oh, that's the set that contains 0, 1, 2, and 3. Oh, and look, 3 is contained in there, 2 is in there, 1 is in there, and 0 is in there, right? And so a one number is contained in another number if one is less than 1. That's a nice little feature to have, to be able to compare them like that. Might be an accident. I'm not sure. But this raises a question. Is that two? Um, well, you could argue it is, right? That's how we defined it. But, you know, if that's two, if you go back to my um, PDF, all three pages of it, you have to say that's 10. Now, how many people truly think that PDF I made is 10? That that Anybody um, want to argue that? So, yeah? I would say it is as much 10 as lambda calculus. Well, so, I would say it's really an encoding, right, of something else. I mean, the, the best notion of 10 is sort of the inductive definition of the naturals. I, I think that sort of the, the inductive definition of zero or suck of a nat is um, the kind of the best definition you could have hoped for with these things. That's, but then again, 10 is in the reals and it's in the rationals too, so you have a bunch of different representations of this thing. But they're all, whatever they are, they should be the same under some map. So whatever this notion is, there should be some invariant and you should be able to map from one to the other seamlessly and they, one could argue that they all have a right to coexist as various versions of 10 and that they're in some sense the same at least when you're talking about numbers and that's um, kind of another viewpoint that's been taken up a lot in particular in categorical contexts and categorification of numbers and things like that. So. Um, yeah, so, ah, the axiom of replacement, and I'm pretty sure that, um, it should say in Haskell, but, you know, but you guys do call it map, uh, still, right? You didn't, I know you changed some things around I enumerables and I traversables, but that's still map. So, the axiom of replacement. So, this axiom is actually both very straightforward and very difficult at the same time. It's very straightforward because it says, hey, if you have a set and you have a function out of that set, the range of that function is also a set. The problem is, oftentimes sets come with x, I'm sorry, functions come with domains and not ranges, but codomains. So there's a source, a target, and a function between them. And the problem with this kind of a version of replacement is to say that, well, you do, the, the function doesn't really have a, a target, or if it does, it, the target is the class of all sets, right? So there is a sense in which that is kind of um, clunky, so you have to talk around that in some way. And this is how you do this. So, 
in, in Haskell, this is called map, right? It just says if you have a, a map from some set, which is the source, then its range is also a set. And so you have an implementation of it. And this, another axiom which is kind of weird, um, this axiom often holds by default in because the compiler will not let you build this. And what it says is that a set cannot contain itself, right? Although, I, I meant to try this. Can you uh, make a list in Haskell that contains itself? I don't think so. You can? Because the laziness actually lets you get away with this. So, that's what I thought. So, in Haskell, this actually does not hold because you have laziness. And what it, what, what it says strictly is that if you have a set, that set has some element in it such that that element is disjoint from the big set itself. Now, for a set that contains it, if x is equal to the set that contains x, well, this says that x must contain an element which is disjoint from x. But it only has x, and x intersect x have to be empty, so then x must be the empty set. Oh, but then if x is the empty set, you have that the empty set is equal to the set that contains the empty set, and you get the classical contradiction that 0 is equal to 1. Uh, at least, you know, because the empty set is 0 and the successor is 1. But uh, you get the empty set is a, yeah, so you, so that's the axiom of regularity. And in, in practice, this axiom has very little effect on the practice of mathematics, except in set theory itself. And the reason people like it is it actually makes the universe of sets very well ordered and not well ordered, but nicely ordered, and it, it allow, you, you don't get these big circular containments that you might otherwise get, and it makes things manageable, although there are theories which, there are some theories which relax this, and that um, is, and, um, and they have been studied somewhat too, so. Because it regular, it makes everything regular and nice, and you know. So, so that's about as best as I can do. And the honest truth is, there is about five different in five different fields of math at least. There are five different notions of regularity in topology. There's something called regular spaces, and in some other field, there are regular these things and those things. So. Regular is just some word that people used to, to, um, to um, convey a certain type of order and niceness, and that's, I think, as far as that goes, but somebody, else, somebody might know the history better than I, so, you know. Um, so, Okay, the dreaded axiom of choice. Um, with the axiom of choice, I, um, I like to explain this differently because I like cookies. Um, and what this says, so, so when I was, um, when I, one way to understand it is, um, you know, if you have a set and it's non-empty, you can pick an element out of it. So if you have a cookie jars with cookies, you can reach into the cookie jar and eat the cookie, right? That's um, an argument I made. That's not exactly what the axiom of choice says. The axiom of choice is actually a little bit more um, complicated to it, this, but it can be made equivalent by using products. So, but the, the statement here is that um, what axiom of choice actually says is that if you have any number of cookie jars, it could be an infinite number of cookie jars. Uh, and each of those cookie jars has at least one cookie in it. You can just go down the line for all eternity and take a cookie from each cookie jar and 
keep eating cookies. So, um, there's, so, so, but this is uh, very important because you remember our proof at the beginning that says you can um, create these um, equivalence classes and then for each equivalence class you start picking things out of the, um, each bucket. And this tells you no matter what you do, you have a way of doing that. Do you know precisely what you are going to get? Not necessarily. Um, it could be sort of random with respect to the bucket, so it might, not, it might have very little regularity. Now, the problem with the axiom of choice is it leads to some bizarre facts about sets when you have it. So there's a um, construction called Banach-Tarski, which relies on the axiom of choice that says if you take a three-dimensional ball, the ball has, um, it's not just the surface of the earth, but it's the crust and all the stuff in the middle too, you can chop it into six pieces, take those six pieces, rearrange them in such a way to get two balls of the same exact size you started with. And if, um, and, um, y you know, so my eyes light up when I hear that and say, hey, I can get rich from this, right? And the answer is no, because the pieces which you break it up aren't measurable. That is literally true. The, 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 these pieces are non-measurable sets. You can't assign a volume to them in, a, in any meaningful way. So these sets aren't physical in any, they, they don't even model thing that could remotely be physical. So this is the sort of randomness you get with the axiom of choice and it introduces certain weird things. But it's important enough because it tells you that any vector, any vector space you want, you can pick a basis, or that you can pick representatives for any um, equivalence class. Um, but here's the good news about the axiom of choice. It also, it's free when you have finite sets. When you have finite sets, it's free because, well, what would you call such um, the axiom of choice if you were to implement it? Well, you have, um, if you think of sets as lists, well, you have a, a list of lists. Each of the lists is non-empty. So you just write map cons, and you get a cookie from each of those cookie jars, right? Map head. Map head. Thank you. Um, so you map head over the list, and you get something. And so, oh, I made it bigger. Okay, that's, these are the um, consequences I just told you about. Um, so I could go on to tell you how you make functions in, so, so I actually haven't told you how to make functions in set theory, but it's, um, you just take ordered pairs of um, the domain and range and so on. Um, I could go through that or um, I did promise some amount of code. So code. Um, now, where did you go? Far right. No. Code. So, um, um, Text edit. I'm. Is it bigger? Okay, so it, I apparently lied to you and said I did it in Notepad, and I did not. It's text edit. So I'm very sorry for that. Um, I hope you don't um take. <laughs> right. So. I will say um, it made me um, appreciate the existence of IDEs. So it was, um, it was good for the soul. So, okay, so let's go through some of this. Um, so I wanted to define ZFC sets in here. And what is it? Well, 
I defined ZFC sets to be lists of ZFC sets. And so you automatically have the empty list, and then you have things, lists whose entries are themselves um, ZFC sets. Now, you might say, okay, these aren't exactly the ZFC sets you were talking about. Lists are ordered and allowed duplicates and all that stuff, and this isn't what you were talking about. Well, my answer is, well, it depends, again, whether or not you decide to take um, extensionality as an axiom or a definition. So here, I'm taking it as a definition, and I actually sit down and write extensionality. Now, I also did a lot of this in Lisp, and the code in Scheme, but the code in Haskell is actually a lot easier because Scheme, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Haskell gives you some uh, niceties. Like, um, you can have these deriving ORD, right? And so you can do things like, hey, sort the thing for me, right? And it actually makes the, uh, you, you don't have to write your own comparator and put your own ordering on these things. It's already there. So I define some auxiliary things. Um, so this thing here defines me a function that um, takes a, a list of ZFC sets and tacks on a ZFC at the end. So I can distinguish them from regular lists. And here I have CFZ, which uh, takes the ZFC tag off. So it undoes the ZFC and just turns it into a regular old list of ZFC sets. So that's what that does. And here, these two, I don't write any code with them, but I at least wrote the um, data types because you might want ZFC sets that also allow you to have some other types of things like actual integers rather than these von Neumann integers, natural, num natural numbers, sorry. Um, so the von Neumann natural numbers is this construction I showed you of making the integers out of putting these bags together. So here is, um, here you're allowing atoms and collections of sets with the same atoms. And it's roughly the same thing. In fact, I want to think that if I put A in the void type in for A, I should recover my original thing, but uh, yeah, I, yeah, I would? Unit, not void. You, no, unit is uh, void. void. I want void. But I'm a little worried that um, I'm going to have two empty sets somehow. So um, I didn't want to assume so. so but I, I, I think if void acts like a void should act, this will do what I think it does. Yes? I don't feel like writing that code. And it's just ugly. It's an ugly edge case. So here I wrote something called von Neumann, which takes an actual integer and turns it into one of these ZFC sets that I showed you, except it um, orders them differently because it's more convenient to put certain things at the head rather than the tail. But so, so all it says is um, zero gets turned into the empty set. And the nth thing essentially turns into um, the last thing const on, I'm sorry, um, put onto the head of the set itself, and this does exactly what you want. And here I define a, um, a thing called the successor function, um, which is slightly um, insulting to you people in the audience, you know, suck it. Um, and all that does is, um, this is just taking it, and it's taking the, the, the list version of what it was, putting it on the head and turning it back into a set. So, and then you can define the net as taking the empty and mapping the successor on the nats themselves. So, hey, we have the axiom of infinity in Haskell, which in Scheme you have to do with streams, and 
so that it's a little bit less nice in scheme. And so this is um, nice. By the way, this does break the axiom of extensionality because if you have infinite sets, how do you tell if two infinite sets are equal? Well, it'll take literally forever, right? Because you have to check it. Either that or you need some syntax check. You've got to be able to check syntax of the, how the things were made. And, um, that's another story. Um, I define map here. It's just wrap, unwrapping and rewrapping regular map in the way you would do, you would do this. And then I define something that um, removes duplicates. And um, I'm making, I, I actually put uh, a little assertion here that the thing has to be orderable because I'm cheating a little bit with my remove duplicates. I'm assuming that this isn't just um, a list of A's, but it is in fact a list of A's that is sorted. So because it's sorted, I can write it by just checking the head with the rest. Just checking neighbors, in other words. So I do cheat a little bit there with that. And then um, I write this normalize. And what normalize does, if you just read from right to left, it says you um, take the set you CFT it, you turn it into a list of sets, you map the normalizing with respect to this equivalence here, over that, you sort it, by the way, ZFC sets are sortable because it has that ORD, and then you remove duplicates with respect to this equivalence, and then you turn it back into a ZFC set. And this takes the set and just sorts it and removes duplicates. So now you can define two ZFC sets to be equal if their normalized versions are actually equal. And so you have a normal form. And so we have that. Now, there's another way of writing ZFC sets which is kind of a little bit lazy. You take data.set and you just say, say that a, a ZFC set is a set of ZFC set, sets and you get the empty set for free. So that's sort of the cheap way of doing it. And so I could have just shown you this line of code and gone home, I guess. But that's no fun. Um, so one more thing to play with is let's open up uh, the terminal and go von Neumann. Can you see that? Well, okay, so von Neumann of zero. Well, that's how we write the empty set. I could have written a nice show function, I suppose, but um, you know this is uh, this is enough to illustrate the idea. So you get a set that contains the empty set, and then just my favorite and. I can be sure that is actually number 10. <laughs> so thank you for um, coming and listening to me Babylon and let's go get some beer in a, a bit. Yeah, I'll take questions. Yes. Um, so the question was extensionality a synonym for equivalence. So it actually has to do with um, the, the extensional and intentional. And it has to do with, in some ways, your viewpoint on equality. Are you looking, or are you, um, 
a deity that can look from outside the system in, inside. And I think that's one way. And then intentional is another, in some sense. I think that's the um, origin. Yes. Um, I'm, that's not particularly satisfying, I know, but, um, other questions? Yes. Uh, the, the axiom of regularity, it said that there must be at least one element that is disjoint from the, uh, one member which is disjoint from the container. Uh, yes. So an example was x equals brackets x. That's a counterexample. That was, sorry, that's a counterexample. Yeah. Um, that is, um, that will be ruled out, um, but I don't remember how. It's because you have now two subsets. You have the a X, the subset of that, and A is a subset of that, and then the subset yeah, you, itself. So, so there's something where you, yeah. So, so um, <laughs> it, they, they all come down to these, uh, it, there's an art to it where you just say, um, oh, Okay, you um, you you find some circle you can run around, and swallow yourself of it. Essentially, it, it's it. So so the proof I gave in that case is um sort of the simplest possible thing, and it's sort of um the uh, the um the model of how the proofs go. In fact, there's a proof that's there is a proof that says you can't have any cycles in the tree, and it is in. It's actually a lot easier than trying to trying to find um, the actual proof in every little case. There's one that covers them all, and if um, I maybe should have dug that up, but I didn't. Yes. Um. Some of them do, some of them don't. Um, where the I, I'm not an expert in the maybe I, I'm not I'm actually not an expert in the fine grained details of when and how the axiom, what what weakenings and strengthenings make what happen and what goes wrong and what goes right. Um, I do know there is a nice um, weakening of the axiom of choice called the axiom of determinacy that is roughly equivalent to saying that all subsets of the real numbers are measurable. So that is nice for a certain, if you like a set theory with a certain physical intuition to it. So that's one I know. That, that's false in ZFC with choice. The constructions you use to get non-measurable subsets rely on the axiom of choice. Now, if you take that away, you don't have the ability to make those sets anymore. And in fact, the ax if you replace it with the axiom of determinacy, you're in that model, the real numbers in that model will in fact all have all subsets measurable. So it's false because you have this axiom playing these tricks on you. It's the, it's the same reason you can cut, cut the ball into six pieces, is you have these non-measurable things. I'm sorry? Can it be? OK. For some reason, six stuck in my head. Um, other questions? Yes. Um, I think you call that a research project. Um, but you can do it, yeah. You, um, the question was, can you take the axioms and express them in uh, Haskell? And yeah, they're mostly pretty straightforward. Like, reg um, you know, regularity doesn't hold because you can make sets that contain themselves because of laziness. Um, which one was it? Um, replacement is just map, um, which, um, Comprehension is filter. Um, 
union is uh, join. And so a lot of the axioms are actually mostly one-liners and then you just wrap it and then un unwrap it with these ZFC containers. And so it's actually pretty, um, it's not that bad. You can do choice. I mean, that's just mapping. That's just the infinities get funny. The infinities get funny. It all works correctly in the finite case. In the yes. Case, some things hold that should, and some things don't hold that should. Um, well, they only hold after infinite time. Yeah, that's right. So, you had a question, Greg? No, and I don't care to. <laughs> um, I don't know. Why don't you make one and see? Um, other questions? Okay, thanks.